Welcome back. Today we are going to be studying Genesis chapter 12. Now the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12 centers around the promise that God makes to Abram. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in this episode uh, thinking about that. So picking up in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse th- uh, 1, the text says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out from your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This promise that God made to Abram, or Abraham, is a critically important moment to understand in Scripture. Um, For example, if this, one of the things that we have to think about with this promise is that if this promise that God made to Abraham is ultimately about the physical nation of Israel, then that's going to impact the entire way we look at Scripture, go from here going forward. However, if this promise that God makes to Abram is ultimately about something or someone else, then that's also going to greatly impact our view of Scripture. We've been talking a good deal, I've mentioned several times, how all the Old Testament, it looks forward to, it builds up to Christ. And we see that from Scripture with this promise as well. For example, it did have, this promise to Abram did have an aspect where God was referring to the physical nation that would come from him. He said, uh, your descendants, I, I will make you a great nation. Israel became a, ultimately became a great nation. You think about the time when David and Solomon were the kings over this nation. They were certainly a great nation during that time. Uh, God promises Abraham, you will, you know, you will have a descendant. There will be families and descendants come from you. As we're going to go through the book of Genesis, we're going to see in several chapters that Abraham's going to have a son. Abraham and Sarah are going to have a son named Isaac. God keeps that promise. And God promises to to give him this land, to a land that he would show him. And God kept that promise and ultimately gave all the descendants of Abraham, gave them all the land that he promised to give them. Joshua 21, verse 43 through verse 45 says that God gave them All the land he promised, he gave it all to him. Also, Joshua 23, verse 14. So there is certainly an aspect in which the physical descendants of Abraham are in mind, but ultimately, as we look to the New Testament, I think what we will find is that ultimately this promise to Abraham, it was not solely about the descendants, the physical descendants of Abraham, but it was about something and someone more. For example, in Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse uh, verse 7, it says, now, thinking about the seed promise to Abraham, this passage in Genesis 3, verse 1, the whole section, I suppose, goes all the way through Galatians 4, verse 7, shows that the ultimate fulfillment of the seed promise to Abraham refers to Jesus Christ and those who belong to him. It says in Galatians 3, verse 7, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons or descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So it's pointing out that saying this is looking forward, Paul saying, That promise was looking forward to what would come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. That's what Paul's pointing out. And then speaking of Jesus Christ, he says in Galatians 3, this is picking up with verse 16. He says, Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, referring to this promise we just read in Genesis 12, he does not say, and to seeds, plural, as if as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Galatians 3, verse 16. Paul says, who is that promise to Abraham ultimately pointing to? 
It's not ultimately pointing to the seed promise. It's not ultimately pointing to Isaac. It's not ultimately pointing to the physical descendants of Abraham. It's ultimately pointing to Jesus Christ. And as you go through, he talks about in Galatians 3, beginning with verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul points out in Galatians 3, verse 1, all the way through chapter 4, verse 7, that the ultimate fulfillment of the seed promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, the ultimate fulfillment of the seed promise part of that promise is Jesus Christ and those who are his. Now, what about the, there's I guess three parts to this promise, the seed, the nation, and the land. The seed promise is pointing to Jesus Christ and those who belong to him. Well, what about the nation? If you look at, and I'm going to read this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 or verse 9 through verse 10 we're going to notice something very interesting here just as the seed promise ultimately pointed to Jesus Christ and those who are his it probably doesn't surprise you that the nation promise ultimately points to those who are Christ as well he says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 and 10 writing to Christians He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Who is God's holy nation? Who is God's own special people? Who are the ones who once were not a people but are now the people of God? Peter says he's writing to Christians. Peter says it's you. If you are in Christ, those who are Christians, those those who, as Paul says back in Galatians chapter 3, those who have put on Christ in baptism, you are now the nation of God. So the seed promised to Abraham was ultimately about Jesus Christ and those who are his. The nation promise ultimately refers to those who are in Christ Jesus, who are now the the holy nation, the special people of God. But then the third part of this promise that God makes to Abraham, probably at this point not a shock to you, I think Scripture also shows where the land promise to Abraham is ultimately not about that little strip of land over there in the Middle East, but it's ultimately about the city in the heavenly country where God lives. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through verse 16, speaking of people like Abraham, he said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In Hebrews, going over another chapter to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through verse 24, the Hebrews writer says, Uh, In comparison to Mount Sinai, where Moses and the children of Israel were gathered around and they were afraid, even Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. The Hebrews writer says, writing to Christians, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Once again, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, the church of the firstborn, speaking of Christ, 
who are registered, or the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The heavenly city where God lives. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 through verse 21, he said, our citizenship, our home country is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we think about this promise that God made to Abraham, ultimately the seed promised to Abraham is about Jesus Christ and those who are his, Christians. The ultimate fulfillment of the nation promise to Abraham is referring to those who are in Christ Jesus, Christians, the holy nation of God, his own special people today, those in the kingdom of Christ. And the ultimate fulfillment of the land promise to Abraham is the city in the heavenly country where God lives. So ultimately, this promise that God makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 3 is ultimately pointing forward to Jesus Christ and all the blessings that God would offer to those in Christ. And so that leads us to ask a question. Is the physical nation of Israel God's special people today? And the answer to that question is, well, no. Now, God certainly still cares for them and wants them to be saved. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 8, and Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 4 lay this out plainly. God still cares for them and desperately wants them to be saved. But if the Jewish people, if they desire to be God's special people, it's only going to be through the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 16 through 17, the same as everyone else. Anyone and everyone can be a part of the special people, the holy nation of God, but it is only through Jesus Christ. No other way can you be a part of the people, the nation of God, only through Christ. God's special people today are those who are Christ, Christians, the ones who have been transferred into the kingdom of Christ, Colossians 1.13, the ones that Christ has added to his church, Ephesians 2, verse 47, or Ephesians 4.4 4 and Acts 2, verse 47, the ones who Paul refers to as the Israel of God today, Galatians 6, verse 16. And this is not because we are so great in and of ourselves, but it's because of Jesus Christ. And so, all the way back here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, we have a very important promise to Abraham that is ultimately pointing forward to what God is going to do for all people through Jesus Christ. And so now, kind of with that groundwork laid, we move back to Genesis chapter 12, and we pick up with verse 4, and we go through verse 9, because Abram does exactly what God tells him to do. He leaves his home country. So Abram departs as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now the first leg of this journey was when they left Ur and they traveled to Haran. That's Genesis 11 verse 31. That was about a 600 mile trip. They were going to Canaan, but for whatever reason they stopped in Haran. And that's where... Genesis 11.32 tells us that Abram's father died. Now, the second leg of this trip was leaving Haran and traveling to Canaan, specifically to Shechem. That was about 400 miles. And so remember also in this trip, Abram, Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 8 tells us that Abram did not know where he was going. God simply told him, leave and I will show you where you're going. You keep traveling day after day, mile after mile, and I'll let you know when we get there. That's basically what God tells Abraham. Now, what it says about uh, where Abraham was when the Lord appeared to him and told him this is the place, what it says is very interesting. Deuteronomy, there's a connection here to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 through verse 32, as the 
descendants of Abraham, the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 through 32, there's an interesting connection to when they are about to enter the land. It says in Deuteronomy 11, beginning with verse 26, it says, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Now it shall be, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal? Here's the connection. Beside the terebinth trees of Morah, that was also mentioned when Abraham came into the land. For you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God has given you, and you will possess it and dwell in it. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. The place recorded here in Genesis 12 is the same one mentioned later in Deuteronomy, when Abraham's descendants now have come out of Egypt and they're about to come into the land. And the point is this, Abraham trusted and obeyed God and he was blessed. The point in Deuteronomy is you too will be blessed if you trust and obey God. If not, you will be cursed. And also, just as God kept his promises to Abram, he will also keep his promises to you. And so there's an interesting connection then to Abraham coming into the land in Genesis 12, God keeping his promises, God blessing him, and later when the children of Israel get ready to come back to the land, that connection is made back to Abraham. They're pointed back to the example of Abraham. Follow his example. It's also interesting that in the book of Romans, Paul does this quite a bit as well. Follow his example of faith and trust in God. Now, Abram's initial response when he gets into the land and God tells him this is the place, his initial response is to build an altar to the Lord. Noah had the same response when they came out of the ark in Genesis 8 verse 20. So we see the Lord keeping his promise and bringing Noah and his family through the flood, and then Noah worships the Lord we then see the Lord keeping his promise and bringing Abraham into the land that he said he would show him. And once again, we see Abram worshiping the Lord. And then it says, going back now to Genesis chapter 12, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Jacob would later name this place Bethel, which means house of God, Genesis 28, 16 through 19. And what's emphasized here in Genesis 12 is that Abram is in the place where God is. He is with God. He builds another altar. He calls on the name of the Lord. The altar would mean a worship and thanksgiving. Calling on the name of the Lord is connected with salvation or deliverance. And the point of this section here is Abram is worshiping God. He is walking where God is. He is trusting God right now. However, as we keep reading, picking up in Genesis 12, verse 10, Abraham keeps traveling, and he leaves Canaan, and he goes down to Egypt. It says, beginning in Genesis 12, verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. We, uh, we're given the reason why Abram went down to Egypt. We're told there was a famine in the land that God had brought him to. So picture this in your mind. Abram has traveled around 1,000 miles not knowing where he's going, and God brings him to a land that's in the middle of a famine? You know, if you had, uh, if you had a lot of animals and people to feed, like Abram did, and you relied upon what the land gave you to feed them all, well, that's a pretty big issue. Immediately, Abram's trust, his faith in God is tested. God, you know I've got to provide for all these folks, and you bring me to a land that's in the middle of a famine? It's a test of his faith, of his trust in God. Now, it says Abram goes down to Egypt. In the Old Testament, 
Egypt is a place of slavery, a place of sin, a place that God had brought them out of, and they were not to go back to it. Isaiah 31 verse 1 is just one example of this. And remember the original audience of the book of Genesis, it's the children of Israel. They are the first ones hearing this, and they would have just been brought out of Egyptian slavery, of Egyptian bondage, and now they hear of Abraham going there. It says, that going back to our text, it says, And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know you're a woman of beautiful countenance. You are very beautiful to look upon. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. So please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. What has happened to our man who was worshiping and trusting God just a few verses earlier? He's no longer living in the house of God. Fear has now begun to creep into his thinking. When our trust in God is is tested, be ready because fear is often waiting at the door. Paul, in writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 7, Paul knew Timothy's faith in God was being tested, and he says God has not given us a spirit of fear in 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. He knew Timothy's struggling with fear right now, and this is a test to his faith. The antidote to fear when our trust in God is tested is to remember that he is still with us and to trust his guidance through his word. Psalm 23, verse 1 through 4 reminds us of that. Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So being motivated by fear, Abram and Sarah agreed to tell a lie to save, to protect Abraham's life. So it was, back to our text, when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. So, Abram was partly correct in his thinking. The Egyptians immediately noticed the beauty of Sarai and brought her to Pharaoh. And then the text goes on to say that he treated Abram well for her sake. Remember, he thinks Abram is her brother. She had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, uh, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house, house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Pharaoh upon discovering that Sarah is actually Abram's wife, Pharaoh is shaken by the fact that he had nearly married another man's wife. And we might, uh, we might be tempted to think that everything worked out all right for Abram in the end here. But if he had continued to trust God, it appears that Pharaoh would not have done what Abram feared. Abram feared... They're going to see how beautiful Sarah is, and they're going to kill me, her husband, and take her to be their wife. But it seems Pharaoh, he, he, is, he is shaken by the fact, I almost married another man's wife. That bothered him. A man who is bothered like this by that fact, he would not have done what Abram was afraid of. Abram's fears were not grounded in reality. He was afraid it would happen, but it turns out that's probably not what would have happened if he had just trusted God. In a place that is associated with sin throughout the scriptures, that's Egypt, Abram tells a lie, which takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. What does the serpent do when he comes to Eve? He tells a lie. So we're reminded of the problem of sin. It's still an issue, even with Abram. Now, we think about what we have just read here, and there's something that's worth considering, and it kind of, it will build into our next episode. Abram had trusted God every day on his 1,000-mile journey 
from his homeland to Canaan. And then he goes to Egypt, and his trust in God falters. You know, just like Abraham, sometimes our trust in God passes the test, like it did with Abraham on that thousand-mile journey day after day. And sometimes, like Abraham when he went down to Egypt, sometimes we stumble and we fall short, and our faith in God falters. Now, the next chapter... Lord willing, which we'll get into next week, the next chapter in Genesis teaches us a very important lesson based on this. When our trust in God does fail, when our trust in God does falter, chapter 13 reminds us, go back to where you once were. Go back to where God is, and there your faith in him will be strengthened once more. I appreciate you studying along through Genesis chapter 12 with me. Lord willing, next time we will get into Genesis 13. Until then, I hope you have a good rest of your day.